Good evening and welcome. My name is Mark Evelsizer and I am an alumnus of the Drucker School. Uh, I want to welcome everybody here and uh, thank you so much for coming to hear this very important topic that is a, of national uh, import and concern and uh, we're going to have a panel discussion on Obamacare, its myths and realities. I would first uh, like to mention before we begin that this session is being recorded. So if any of you are in the Federal Witness Protection Plan, <laughs> you may want to sit in the dark or leave once the question and answer session begins. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I would first like to introduce uh, one of our uh, current students. He's a doctoral student at the Drucker School. Uh, he's uh, the superman on our planning committee. Uh, without his efforts and support, uh, this evening wouldn't have been possible. Uh, he brings a very strong co-sponsor and partner to the table, Tri-City Medical Center, and uh, we really value that partnership. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Francisco Valle. Francisco is the Director of Business Development for Multicultural Markets at Tri-City Medical Center. And he would like to introduce the Tri-City uh, Medical Center team. Francisco. Good evening. Thank you for being with us tonight. We, first, we'd like to welcome you, you on behalf of our more than 3,000 personnel, including doctors, nurses, volunteers, you know, our board of directors. Uh, our CEO three years ago when uh, our CEO came to the organization with the support also of the board of directors of the hospital. We changed the approach that we, ha that we used to have on how to, you know, link with the community. And this event tonight is an example of that. We are really honored the Claremont Graduate University and, and the Drucker School allow us, you know, and invited us to host them tonight. And it's a great partnership. Thank you very much. So without any further ado, all I'd like to say is, again, thank you, you know, on behalf of our board of directors, our CEO, and the more than 3,000 employees. And we look forward to seeing you in another event. Thank you. So uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, just to give it a little context, what is the Drucker School, a graduate school of management doing down in San Diego, co-hosting event with uh, Tri-City Medical Center? Um, we're a small school. We have about 5,000 alums. We bring in about 100 to 120 new students every year. We're named after Peter Drucker, one of the fathers of modern management. And um, because we're a small school, we try to reach out to the community whenever we have uh, events so that we can sort of um, promote ourselves, grow our numbers, and get other people interested in our story, and that's what we're doing here today. This is our second event down here, and yet again, a great event put together by our four alums and the uh, representatives from Tri-City. So we want to thank them for letting us um, be down here. If you do like this, uh, keep your eye out, because hopefully we're going to have many more of these. So thank you very much. What we have this evening is a panel discussion, and each panelist will speak for up to 20 minutes each about our topic. The topic is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, informally referred to as Obamacare, which requires that Medicaid be reformed and expanded in order to cover more people, especially those below the poverty level, and aims to enhance community health care centers to improve the health care of those without private health insurance. And so to provide answers about the myths and realities of Obamacare, the San Diego Regional Alumni Group of the Drucker School and Tri-City Medical Center are proud to bring to you the following panel of experts. And this is in alphabetical order. Mr. Larry Anderson. He is the CEO of Tri-City Medical Center. Tri-City is a joint commission accredited district hospital with approximately $400 million in annual revenues, more than 2,300 employees, and a staff of 500 physicians. Mr. Anderson is credited with turning around this hospital, not only financially, but operationally. Tri-City is now profitable, 
and is a recognized national leader in robotic surgery. In addition, Mr. Anderson created a master facility plan which includes the development of a new hospital facility. Uh, our next panelist is Irma Kota. She is the CEO of North County Health Services, a nonprofit community health care organization serving the North San Diego County region. Under her leadership, North County Health Services serves more than 60,000 patients annually at 10 clinic locations. These clinics provide comprehensive medical, dental, mental health, and health education services. Patients with government insurance, commercial insurance, and TRICARE are accepted at North County Health Services as well as those uninsured. In addition, Ms. Kota leads a WIC program, that's Women, Infant, and Children program, serving over 18,000 women and children, and a countywide HIV case management program. Our next panelist is Dr. Deborah Freund. She is the president of Claremont Graduate University. And pri prior to moving to Claremont, she was a distinguished professor of public administration and economics at the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. And was an adjunct professor of orthopedics and pediatrics at Upstate Medical University. Dr. Freund is an internationally recognized health economist, known in particular for her research in the areas of Medicaid, health care outcomes, and pharmacoeconomics, a field she is credited with founding. Mr. Alan Sugarman. He is the Chief Financial Officer of Miramed, a global services company providing business process outsourcing solutions to healthcare organizations nationwide. Miramed partners with hospitals, health networks, physician practices and related industry service organizations to provide a broad portfolio of customizable solutions including practice management, reimbursement services, and consulting services. Please give our panelists a round of applause for being here. Now, after each uh, panelist uh, speaks, we will end with a uh, question and answer session. So as uh, they're triggering thoughts, please write down your questions that you may want to ask later. So here we go. This is Health Reform 101 with a pass-fail test at the end. All right, the first couple of things you have to know to understand the whys of health care reform have to do with health care spending. Now, how did health care spending vary by nation in 2009? The data lag about two or three years always, by the way. Now, um, it's really important. This is the fraction of GDP spent on health care. The very first column is the United States. We're up close to 17%. And most people are alarmed by that. Here you have all the major developed countries in the world. It doesn't, all you gotta do is eyeball to see that the closest person, closest person, the closest country to us is actually Belgium. Although Germany in a lot of ways is a better comparator for reasons that there, I can't, I don't have time to explain today. Why are people alarmed? Well, first of all, let me put this in context. What percent of the GDP goes for defense? You're very close, it's five. You're very close. So I wanted to put in perspective probably the next largest sector in the economy. This is total health expenditures per capita in the U.S. So we're up at almost, as of four years ago, we we're up at almost um, $8,000. We're over about $8,500 about now. And the Norwegian Norway is the closest after us. The U.K. 
is less than half. These are just data. This is why people are alarmed. Um, the next sev set of slides I did with Richard Scheffler and Stephen Shortell at Ber UC Berkeley. I happened to be on a governor's commission on health, and these data uh, were provided by them in, my, uh, in that capacity. Now, forget this priority number one thing. Healthcare spending in California alone, this is the cost curve. It's gone up from 99.3% um, growth rate here to 12 and a half historically over the last decade. That is a 73% increase in health spending over the same period that the gross domestic product of the state was only going up by a third. So our economy is not growing as fast as our health expenses are. And there's a great concern that people are being priced out. Now this will set up um, Alan Sugarman. He'll, he's going to tell you a, bit, a little bit about Massachusetts later. But if you look at health spending and how fast costs have grown, um, you will see health spending, which is in the, in the yellow, and the gross state product is in the blue. You with me? This is actually national data. If you, you have to, it, looking at health spending, you really got to look over a decade. This is, Alan, what, why you got the legislation you did. Because if you look at health spending, you see periods where health spending was growing faster than gross state product here. Then between 03 and 06, about at the same rate, a little less, and then more. One, two, three. This is... Mass, you'll, when you hear about Massachusetts and how they're going to constrain costs um, next, you will understand why I put this up here. So take the long view. Most of the time, historically, spending has been, going, has been growing much faster than the GSP or the gross state product. And the same for the, um, excuse me, um, same nationally. Now, um, in terms of affordability, here's the total single coverage premium as a percentage of median household income. This is for health insurance. Okay, so you see that California, oops, was always, I got to get used to this pointer, in 03, much less, was, um, the premiums as a percentage of median household income was much less than in the nation, and now it's about equal. So we've been doing relatively worse. That's the point. This is um, the total single coverage premium as a percentage of median household income. And uh, this is the premium, and you'll see basically the same story. Now, if you go on the next data that you, so you got to say, well, health care costs are growing faster than the economy. That's fact number one. Fact number two underlying health reform um, regards the number of uninsured. Now, the uninsured have been growing secularly from 36 million to 50 million in 2010. This is 18% of the population. This year is the first time in a decade that we've actually seen a drop. The, the smaller numbers here, or the growth in the uninsured, coincide with two things. Not only an economy going south, but employers not providing health insurance anymore or not providing health insurance to part-time workers, for example. Teens 19 to 25 
comprise the largest age group who are uninsured. And part of the ACA that's already taken effect, though most of it will take effect at the beginning of 2004, allow these kids to stay on their parents' health insurance until the age of 26. And this is why. It will, gr it will lessen the number of insured. I know Alan is in that situation, and I soon will be as of next year myself. Okay, um, the decline in the percentage of people with employment-based insurance has slowed. There was a big decline, and that is why you see the number of insured skyrocketing. Now, it's not going down in a fractional, proportionate sense as much as it had been earlier in the decade, but people are much less likely to get insurance through their employers now than they were a decade ago. Now, Medicare versus Medicaid, you probably all know Medicare is the health insurance program for people 65 years and older, and you qualify if you paid for 24 quarters of Social Security because the two are tied together. Medicaid is a federal state financed program so each state's program is a little bit different. Um, the fraction that the federal government pays, okay, is indirect, is proportionate to the poverty in the state. So a wealthier state, like California or New York, get relatively less money from the federal government than a state like Mississippi and Alabama, which get 50%. Now, the Affordable Care Act uh, has several major aims, to expand access to health insurance coverage, to increase consumer protections, to improve prevention and wellness, improve the quality of care and the delivery system, and curb rising health care costs. All right, access. Remember the 50 million who are uninsured? The idea behind the ACA is if you enact it, the estimates are that the number of uninsured would be decreased by 32 million people. So it's not everybody, but it's a very large chunk. And they would do it through a couple of different mechanisms, of which the most controversial has been the so-called mandate. The mandate is that citizens must have health insurance. Now, individuals who aren't covered by their employers or whose employers drop it because it's too expensive because they're a small employer, or people who don't qualify for Medicaid because they make $1 more, can go to something that I'll describe later called an exchange, which is basically what I call a faux health insurance market. It is a place where, because of the law of large numbers, the state of California would open bids. There's now a whole big exchange board putting this together in this state and go and purchase health insurance. But they pay a penalty. So anybody, the mandate is, if I didn't have health insurance now, I'm required to have it. Just like if I drive a car, I'm in required to have um, automobile insurance. Only in this case, um, it's very complicated to explain, so I won't, except to say that there are going to be subsidies for people who are less able to afford it than I would be. And that's what's supposed to make it affordable. If you don't do this and you don't obey the law, then you're going to pay a, a tax or a penalty for not having health insurance. The second thing is that employers are going to be required, be required to cover workers or pay a penalty if you're large, which is 50 or more. If you're smaller, then your employees can go to the exchange. So in essence, it's a mandate on employers to provide health insurance. Uh, here are the faux exchanges. 
We're going to expand Medicaid to cover people below 133% of the poverty level. Um, that is also controversial, and some states who, who now believe they have the freedom not to do that are talking about going up to 100% of the poverty level and hoping the federal government will pay the rest. But the idea is to take Medicaid, which is the, the federal state health insurance program for the poor, and extend it to people who are poor but not eligible now. Um, and finally, insurance plans are required to cover young adults on their parents' policies. And until this act, they, every 18-year-old was kicked off. I don't know if any of you have kids who were kicked off and you were worried about it, but with a kid about to be 18, I was worried myself. Okay, now consumer protection, the big one, is to ban pre-existing condition clauses. I don't know if you all know what this is, but basically, if you want to switch from one employer-provided health insurance plan because you change employers to another, if you, over the last six months, were diagnosed with cancer, you're not going to be covered under that new insurance plan plan for a while. And that's what a pre-existing condition clause is. By 2014, the ACA says, gone. So you can't cancel coverage. That's called guarantee issue, guaranteed issue. And the other consumer protection here is the medical loss ratio. The way health insurance companies work is Whatever they don't pay out in a claims expense, so if I go to, to Dr. Rob over here and he bills my insurance, okay, for $100, um, and the insurer pays 80 which is about what it would be, at the end of the year, they collect premiums. What's left over in the premium expense that they haven't paid is what their profit is. The medical loss ratio is what fraction of the total premium they pay out in claims. And the law mandates that they have to pay out 80 cents on every dollar. Um, many nonprofit plans are now up at about 90% and several for-profit plans have been around 72, 73%. So 80 is somewhere in the middle. Prevention and wellness, there are going to be grants to states for prevention activities like disease screening and immunizations. And all preventive things, whether immunizations or my mammograms now, have to be covered by my insurance with no cost sharing. So the whole thing would be paid out of health insurance, and I don't have to pay anything out of my pocket for it. And that's supposed to incent healthy behavior and prevention. Quality and performance. This first one... Um, ...could take me hours to explain to you, but... We have a pay-as-you-go system, primarily, except if you belong to an HMO like Kaiser. So if you are in regular fee-for-service insurance, pay-as-you-go, I go to my Dr. Rob, he bills me, and the insurance company pays for whatever I use. And the whole idea here is, if it pays for whatever I use, I have no incentive incentive to use less. So one of the things that's going to happen is how health care is going to be organized and how health care is going to reimbur be reimbursed is going to change not to a pay-as-you-go system, but to a system that hopefully pays for a better outcome or pays for you to be well. 
and pays an organized system of doctors and hospitals and nursing homes and hospices to work together to improve your health at less cost. Um, this is a very, very complicated topic and actually of all these things, one that I know the most about. We don't have time except to say that if the, a if the people who wrote the ACA had their way, they would have banned fee-for-service. But what the ACA did is it built itself right on the private health insurance system we have so that the national health plan we will have is uniquely ours. It is not socialized medicine. And what you need to re know at least is what a definition of socialized medicine is because if you read in the press or if you hear people talking about it in the world of politics, very often the, what somebody will say is socialized medicine isn't. We don't have anything like it. Socialized medicine is a system where everyone is covered by the federal government and the federal government employs the health professionals, owns all of the hospitals and so forth. So that's what that is. Um, I'm not going to go over the rest except to say information technology, there have been a huge number of grants. You've probably seen in many of your physician's offices um, a new <coughs> excuse me, computerized health record so that next time you don't have to, for the hundredth time, you don't have to say, this is the list of medicines I'm on because somebody will be able to say, last time you were here, you were taking this and this. Are you still? And they'll be able to share it across physicians when everything is, ever, is interoperable so that nobody will prescribe you something which would have a negative interaction with what you're already taking. Um, curb rising health care costs, prevention, better access to primary care physicians whose job it will um, to keep you out of Tri-Cities. I'm sure Larry will talk about that. Uh, better health information technology. ACOs stands for accountable care organizations, this breed of ho hospitals, physicians, hospices, long-term care facilities, health centers, all getting together to keep po a population of people healthy. I won't tell you what bundled payments is for time here. Now, that goes over the ACA. What Congressman Ryan started proposing last year and has now been put into the Republican platform is not as well specified as the ACA because the ACA has been passed. But I'm going to tell you some very basic things about it. And even though it may seem new to you, as in it may seem new to you, um, <coughs> excuse me, because of the Florida Con Republican Convention, it isn't new. These ideas originated with a Stanford Business School professor named Alan Entove and a dear friend of mine who's a health economist. And he basically said, we need more competition in the health system. Because if hospitals were competing against each other for patients, patients would have the ability, if they had the right information, to choose hospitals based on how, how well somebody did with heart surgery and what the price was. We haven't gotten there, we don't have the data yet, but his idea was competition and the way he was going to get there was he said, let every employer give a fixed amount of money to an employee, then there are four or five choices. The employee would pick the one they wanted and if that grant or voucher or what is now being called premium support was not enough to cover the, the premium of the health plan that person chose, they would pay it out of their pocket. And they would weigh the difference in benefits, the difference in doctors and hospitals associated with it amongst the four choices and decide whether they paid just the amount of money that their employer gave them 
more or even less and get a refund. That was the idea, and that's, in fact, the idea behind Congressman Ryan, or v soon he hopes to be Vice President Ryan. Now, this plan applies is a fix for Medicare expenses. That's what it goes after. It applies only to people who are 55 years of age or older now. Those people who are younger would be facing the new system that I'm about to describe. Um, so those people who are younger, people like me, those of us who are in our 60s, for those of us who are 55 years old and one day older have the current system. Um, now, as I described, Medicare is a fee-for-service plan. It was, came in in 1965, and it was meant to be just like private insurance was then. It's a little bit different now because private insurance has moved, but Medicare is still a fee-for-service pay-as-you-go plan. He wants, Ryan wants to ignite competition, um, to have competition in the health insurance market for Medicare. So in essence, it's privatizing Medicare where current governmental Medicare would be one option and, and it would be one option and I, with a voucher or premium support from the government, would go and pick either a private plan or regular standard Medicare as it exists now. And I would have to weigh the doctors, whatever I knew about quality, the hospital networks in choosing the plan I chose versus what it was going to cost me in premium above the premium support amount. That's basically how it would work. Um, they'd have a fixed amount of money to buy health insurance or regular Medicare. There would be a minimum benefit set, a standard benefit set that every private health insurer and Medicare would have to provide so that that would be standard. You can, of course, buy more than that, but that's what you would be comparing. Uh, the government would pay the premium support would be the amount of money it would cost any of us, 55 plus a day in this room, to buy the second least expensive plan. So if you wanted to buy the plan that was more expensive or more than that, then you'd pay the difference yourself. That's how it works. Um, Insurers would compete by indicating how much it costs to buy their plan for the minimum set of benefits. Then I get my premium support and I choose, and in some cases I have to pay more. Um, over time, by 2034, he would raise the age at which you would qualify for Medicare from 65 to 67. Right now, Medicare is really not a health insurance program. It's a social transfer program. And all of us who basically work are taxed, and those taxes pay for Medicare. So that's why I say it's a transfer program. It isn't like you save money out of your employer's paycheck to pay for this, okay? Um, he would cap spending at a half percentage point above the growth rate of the economy. And you're going to hear more about that from Alan because Massachusetts just legislated something like this. So this is one way they would get cost control versus a whole lot of more uh, complicated ways that the ACA or Obamacare plans to do that. Um, so that's the background. I'm not going to tell you what I really think. Um, that's for another day uh, because you've heard enough from me. And I'm sorry, this is not my best lecture. I'm just a little tired today. But I'm very happy to be in Carlsbad. Who's next? All right. I'm glad to be here. I'm here as a political neutral from New Jersey. 
<laughs> and I'm going to talk about Massachusetts, and you'll see why in a second and how it relates to Obamacare. As I said, I'm politically neutral. In 2006, Massachusetts passed health care reform. And it'll sound a little familiar. What it had in it was individual mandate for insurance. It had subsidized coverage for individuals that, under the poverty level. And it had, instead of what an insurance exchange, as Deborah recalled it, they called it the connector. That was 2006. And what it's achieved since 2006 is really pretty good. 98% of the people are insured. 98% compliance, what you had to do in Massachusetts and still have to do is on your personal income tax return, you have to pr prove you have health insurance or there's a penalty. Companies, and it has huge voter approval. And they've been able to pick up more of the uninsured. There's only one problem with this. It's worked well from everyone likes it. The voters like it. Again, companies under 50. But strangely enough, it had nothing in that 2006 legislation about cost constraint. And as a result, I picked a number of populous states arbitrarily that show what happened. But here's Massachusetts, what happened. You can see from 2006, on a cost per capita, their spending's gone through the rough. And in fact, my daughter recently, as part of her graduate degree in economics, did a paper on Massachusetts and showed it's hurting the economy and employers are staying away. The state recognizes that. And in terms of just states, and I pulled this from a Kaiser Foundation report, Massachusetts is the highest cost state in the country, other than Washington, D.C. So. What's just happened, and Deborah briefly mentioned it here, and, I, and it could be the future of health care in this country. It, it'll be in, it's an interesting experiment. Massachusetts just signed a new law last month. And I was in a meeting in April. Oops, I did it too. See, it's pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> Where Steve Walsh, the chairman of the Joint Committee, was working on the new legislation. And I will say this was a cooperative effort between the legislation body, the governor's office, and the health care providers. And as Deborah talked about fee-for-service medicine, he said the traditional days of having heads and beds are over. Massachusetts took the attitude that no more fee-for-service. And, and that's going to be hard there. There were doctors in this room. Uh, the Massachusetts Hospital Association supported this. So it's a big, it's a change. So what does this bill do? What the, one of the overriding goals of this bill is to reduce cost to initially equal to, then in later years, less than the gro growth and gr growth state product. So they want the state income on an overall basis to grow faster than health care costs. That's quite a reversal. So they're not trying to eliminate $200 billion in health care costs over the next 15 years in Massachusetts. So how are they going to do this? Well, one of the things they're going to do to get away from fee-for-service is any health care provider that contracts with the state has to go and contract for something other than fee-for-service. Now, the legislation tries to give some benefit to the free market and said, we're going to be flexible on how you do this, but you're, we're not going to pay you fee-for-service. And so that even includes Medicaid in the state. So that's going to be a large piece of the business. If you don't do that in future years, you're going to have to submit to the state and you don't meet the caps, what they call a performance improvement report, on how you're going to get there, and you're subject to fines of a half a million dollars. So they're trying to put some teeth behind it. Some of the people said there's not enough. Now, the other big thing is price transparency. There's two issues with this, and one of the things I've heard alluded to in all these conference committee reports is what they're going to do is if you're living in Massachusetts and there's a variety of big health care insurance companies there and you need a CT scan and walk down the street to Harvard and they quote you 3000 bucks, but two blocks away you can get it from Tufts for 1500 they want you as a patient to have instant access to that information and make the decision. The other big piece of the puzzle, which is not overtly stated, Boston, as some of you might know, the academic medical centers reign supreme. You've got Mass General and a number of others. There's been recent reports that they are far higher priced at average quality compared to the community hospitals. 
So it's controversial, but it's out there. So that's what this price transparency is about. Now, the other part of it I didn't put in there is the state's establishing a separate commission, the states like to have their bureaucracies, that is going to review all new contracts between insurance companies and hospitals. And if there's too much of a rate increase, the state reserves the right to intervene. So there's a lot going on there. Health information exchange I'll talk on in a minute. Again, as Deborah talked about, the state thinks they have a huge problem with wellness, obesity rates, and they've established some programs, are going to fund some programs to address it. And they're, they're going to kick some money into it and hopefully address it. Okay, health insurance exchange. This is going on in a number of states where there is a central, if you will, information technology hub, a computer system where hospitals, physician offices, your laboratories can all exchange information and share it so that when you show up, for example, in an emergency room with a heart attack, whatever, they can plug into this and know your medical history and know what's going on. All various states are trying to fund it. This is mandated in the new reform law in Massachusetts. And to show the, the, I guess, the emphasis behind it, if you will, the federal government for the first time is kicking in $17 million to Massachusetts to help make it work. Now it's underway, and one of the things that's in the health reform law is it's mandated that every health care provider in the state participate in this. It's not a volunteer thing. For uh, I was serving there and consulting for a while with an anatomical pathology lab. They help diagnose samples for uh, skin cancer, breast cancer, that type of thing. Even they have to participate. So it, it's going to be a multi-year effort, but what the state is committed to getting to where there's transparency in the system and there's information available to all. Now, you might think it might, all this legal and the reform law, which everyone's known is coming for the last year and a half, might constrain activity, business activity. So I thought I'd throw up one quick slide. Cerberus, who, as you might know, is one of the largest private equity firms in the country. They, in the last year, have bought 10 not-for-profit hospitals in Massachusetts. They are the third largest employer in the state now and continuing to grow. <laughs> And their business model is to disrupt the business model of the academic medical centers. It's interesting. We'll see if it works, but that's their stated, that's their stated mission. As, uh, Standard and Poor's, who rates hospitals and, and rates bond issues that hospitals issue to find them, now fund themselves, has come out and said, well, we're not going to say anything, but this law could pressure credit quality among the not-for-profit hospitals. So they're aware of it. And another activity, two of the largest physician groups in the state have decided to come together and merge into a group of a thousand physicians so they can compete in the marketplace. Because in Massachusetts, you have two or three very large health care plans that dominate the state, and these physicians want to try and compete. So. In essence, it's, it's a very interesting experiment. It's just started. People are, it'll be fascinating to see what happens. Some people are talking about, is it the future of healthcare in the United States? And in fact, Forbes magazine recently stated that, is this the future of this country? As I say, I'm neutral on it. It'll be interesting to see what happens. But this, all the state healthcare providers are preparing for it. Okay, so I guess I should be agnostic too. Is that okay? Um, uh, that's that's very helpful information. Uh, what I intend to present, oh, it's already up there. See if I can work the clicker. Good. Uh, is the employer's perspective because I'm first and foremost uh, a large employer, uh, also a healthcare provider. But I think there's uh, there's some important uh, facts about Obamacare that we need to know, and we call this myth and reality, so I'm not sure if you guys are the myth, but I'm definitely going to be the reality. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> let's jump right in. A lot of this I'm going to be able to skip over, so I'll preface it by saying 
I have 41 slides. However, I'm going to list them on uh, tricitymed.org, our website, so that anyone who wants to go there and look them up. What I've tried to compile here is really everything I think you need to know about Obamacare because nobody's mentioned yet, but the legislation is somewhere around 2,000 pages. It was, I heard it was 2,400 pages. That's the version I looked at, but it depends on what font size you use uh, and whether you double space it or single space it. Some people say it's only 1,800 pages. And the one thing I know for sure is Nancy Pelosi never read it because she said that after she passed it. <laughs> so we know that. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk about Obamacare. I'm going to talk about uh, the mandates, uh, some of the timelines and requirements. Nobody's mentioned the Supreme Court ruling, which is sort of a non-issue, but I think it's worth uh, noting and, uh, and then give you some conclusions. But in the process of that, what I'm going to specifically mention, and the thing that's most important about my presentation, is I'm going to talk about what, what uh, Obamacare is going to do to the cost of health care for my 2,300 employees at Tri-City Medical Center. So you can then extrapolate that to your, uh, your company uh, or anyone else's company uh, based on its size and the design of its plan. A lot of this information, uh, Deborah and Alan already went over. We got a lot of uninsured people. The costs uh, of Medicare are very erratic across the country. Uh, in some places, um, El Paso, for instance, the average Medicare beneficiary is getting $7,500, and McAllen, Texas, uh, 15000 So there's really no question, I think, in anyone's mind that our system is broken and needs repair. That, that I think, we all can agree on. Um, this slide isn't quite uh, organized correctly. This is why I said uh, defense costs were 6% because I was looking at 1960 and you were looking at 2007. So good call, Deborah. But you can see that health care costs have skyrocketed in comparison to both education and defense. And this is a slide, a version of uh, which um, Deborah showed as well to show that the costs in the United States are out of control in comparison to the rest. This uses the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and you can see that we're uh, by far the highest. Uh, now, it, with regard to the specific provisions, and uh, the provisions I really want to talk about are the taxes, because we all hear it's a tax. Justice Roberts said it's really a tax. What he meant was the penalty portion of it is a tax. But what he didn't say, and what needs to be said, is that embedded in Obamacare are dozens of taxes, all of which are already affecting us, uh, and so I'm going to highlight some of those. Uh, this is just a quick uh, summary of the financing components of it, of Obamacare, and I won't go through all of it, but you can see there are provider taxes, there's uh, health savings account distribution changes, Medicare Advantage plan changes. Many of these have already taken effect. Some of them have not. Uh, there's a federal income tax uh, change in the uh, amount of itemized deductions that you have to show for uh, medical costs before you can get anything. It's been years and years since I could deduct a penny for my medical uh, costs, and I'm sure that's true of most of the people in the room. There's a change in the uh, FICA health insurance portion that's coming next year for high wage earners. Uh, there's a change uh, in Medicare dish payments, which is going to be very important for hospitals. Uh, one of the concepts that I see in Obamacare is, notwithstanding the fact that there's many changes going on for hospitals, I think hospitals are going to survive uh, relatively intact. In other words, there's, there's some benefits because we're going to get paid for people who used to show up at our emergency room and get care for free, uh, but those uh, benefits are going to be offset by a lot of the cuts. Uh, for instance, they're going to disallow payments for readmissions and so on, but I think that will balance out and hospitals will be generally okay. I think everyone else is not okay. Uh, I think uh, patients are going to be hurt by the law. I think uh, um, taxpayers obviously are going to be hurt. But I think hospitals are probably going to survive. Physicians are really going to be hurt. And my biggest concern about the implementation of this law when all is said and done is access to care. That is whether or not I'm going to be able to get care, whether you're going to be able to get care. Because right now, uh, if you just want a routine cardiology examination in our area here in North County, you'll wait two months. If you get it in six weeks, you're lucky. It's probably two months. I think this could double or triple the waiting time to get in to uh, see a doctor. There's also a tax on Cadillac plans. Uh, that's not going to affect uh, anybody in this room, I'm sure. Uh, we all have just the routine HMOs, I know. Uh, this is the individual mandate, 
and it's graduated. It starts at 1% uh, of adjusted gross income and uh, elevates to 2.5% of adjusted gross income. Uh, and this is the penalty that was declared uh, by the Supreme Court, approved by the Supreme Court, uh, but uh, identified as authorized only under Congress's uh, taxing authority, not under the Commerce Clause. So uh, large employers, as Deborah said, uh, will uh, wind up paying the penalty. And this is the definition of large employers. It's uh, 50 or more. And there's uh, gradations of that, uh, different rules for uh, employers over 100. And this is called the player pay uh, mandate. So uh, the employer mandates can go up to $3,000. They start at $2,000 and get graduated, uh, depending on uh, uh, the wealth of your employees. They use an average wealth of four times the federal poverty level. Employees are also required to, uh, employers are also required to offer free choice vouchers to certain low income employees. And I won't define what that is, but you can, you can look it up on our website. So the bottom line is uh, know your numbers. I'm talking to employers now. Uh, know your numbers because the implications of health care reform are going to be far reaching in many areas for uh, cost, obviously, for talent management and productivity. So you need to pay attention to uh, how the law will affect your individual company. There are small business tax credits. These are already in effect. Uh, and you can get a credit uh, of as much as 35% of the employer's contribution uh, for the purchase of uh, qual uh, for qualified small employers for the, per for the uh, cost of your plan, uh, and that's going to go up in future years. You can get a credit of 50% uh, in 2014 and beyond, as high as 50%. There are changes to the health care flexible uh, savings accounts, uh, which used to have no limit, and now we'll have a limit of a maximum of $2,500. I know I'm going over this quickly, but I want to give Irma a chance also to talk and then to take questions. Uh, and I'm not even to the most important point I want to make. Uh, itemized deductions for medical expenses, as I said, are going to go up from 7.5% of adjusted gross to 10%. Uh, that happens in 2016. Um, this, this provision limits deductibility of executive compensation for insurance providers. It's fairly esoteric, but what it does is it changes the amount that an employer can deduct from their taxes uh, to 500000 per taxable year. Uh, normally, that would be, uh, that, uh, there would be allowed a $1 million uh, of deduction. Uh, there's a change in uh, Medicare Part D. Uh, the Act eliminates the federal income tax deduction for the 28 percent uh, subsidy for employers who maintain prescription drug plans. Uh, this is uh, uh, promoting employer responsibility. The Act requires employers with 50 or more who do not offer health coverage uh, employees to pay the penalty, the $2,000 that I referred to earlier. Uh, and that penalty increases. We covered that. Uh, in 2014, there will be exchanges. That's going to be an uneven, now with the Supreme Court decision, I think that's going to be an, uh, an unlevel playing field, if you will, because I think some states will decide uh, to opt out of the exchange uh, provisions. Uh, there is um, uh, a, an incentive for wellness programs. I think that's a positive. There's a lot of positives in the, in the law, and I think this is one of them where they will uh, actually allow uh, employers to offer incentive plans and give them uh, tax benefits for for that for the wellness program efforts. Uh, this is what's called the Cadillac plan excise tax for very rich plans, uh, and those those are plans which uh, which cost ten thousand two hundred dollars for a self only or twenty seven five for a family, and it uh, provides a, a penalty or a, an additional tax on top of that. Uh, and then other considerations, um, uh, the Act provides that health coverage offered under a collective bargaining agreement. This is uh, obviously a union-driven provision in the plan. Uh, it grandfathers collective bargaining agreements. Uh, so some people, uh, some uh, uh, companies will benefit from that. This is, the, this is the heart of what I wanted to present. I took Tri-City Medical Center's health care costs which are now in the area of $14 million a year. So we're a kind of a typical large employer. 
Uh, and I, I prepared this summary of what the cost increases are going to be for us with regard to how Obamacare looks now. And uh, you really only need to focus, let's see if I can find this pointer thing. There it is. Uh, this, is the, this is the most important column here because this is exactly what is going to happen to us. We're going to have an increase in costs of $1.8 million, which are all attributable to pure health care reform costs over and above our trend in renewal increases. In other words, as the, the consumer price index goes up and the cost of uh, health care goes up, we'll see those cost increases as well, but we'll get $1.8 million directly from taxes. And that will be due uh, to additional enrollments, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and additional benefits that are provided for and are mandatory uh, in the law and, and a tax effect as well. The, these two columns here are what would happen if we didn't offer insurance. And what you have to look at from your company's standpoint is we're a large company that has a fully paid for self-only plan. In other words, if you come to work at Tri-City, you get yourself paid for for free. You pay a fairly small premium to insure your entire family. So when I first heard about Obamacare, I thought, won't apply to us because we provide insurance for our employees and how could you expect anyone to, per to have a better health care plan than we do? But if you actually read all the fine print in the 2,400 or so pages, you find there's all kinds of nonsense going on in terms of what the additional costs will actually be. So this, these next couple of slides are important because they break down what those costs are. First of all, you have the individual mandate, which requires everyone to have insurance, virtually everyone, or risk a penalty. Uh, and then employers with uh, 200 or more employees are required to automatically enroll newly eligible full-time employees and re-enroll existing employees. And here's what the effect was on us. We have a fully insured plan, and yet we have 381 employees who are eligible for coverage by the definition, but who do not accept our insurance for whatever reason. Now, most of those people have coverage elsewhere. So you have a dual income family, and they're insured somewhere else. But not everyone is in that category. Some people don't accept the plan because they can't afford it. Because even though we offer self for free, let's say they need to insure their family. And we have a variety, quite a wide cross section of wage earners. We have nurses, 750 nurses. They're generally considered high wage earners. Uh, they, would be, uh, they would be exempted from these issues because uh, they would be able to pay for their insurance, whether uh, individual or family. Uh, but we also have food service workers and environmental service workers who, are not, who would not be considered high wage earners. So they opt out of our plan and decide either not to have insurance or take some uh, minimal form of insurance. So we're estimating, and we're doing this very conservatively, that 25% of our eligible employees will join some, uh, f either through the exchange or some other method, will become insured. And the cost to us of that is $1.2 million. If 50% join the plan, the cost is 2.36. 75% join the plan, the cost is 3.55, and so on. So we're, for the purpose of this uh, exercise, I'm saying that tw just 25% of our eligible 381 employees decide to go into the exchange and we have to pay for them, the cost of that is 1.2 million. Uh, so uh, in addition, uh, as Deborah mentioned correctly, uh, we've got a cost for some provisions that are already underway, uh, which is that you're, there's mandatory coverage for, for women's health services, uh, mammograms and so on. And the cost to us in 2014 will be 85000 for that. And then there's coverage for obesity screening and counseling for adults. And the cost to us will be 425000 in 2014. So when you take all of these costs and aggregate them together, you can see here in 2013, the year we're just about to enter, we're going to pay uh, almost $500,000 just for programs that are mandated by the law that are already now in effect. Uh, and that's going to further drive up our cost. And then you have consumer taxes, and these hit also in 2013. Uh, they're taxes that are incurred in 2012, uh, but what we will actually wind up paying in 2013. Uh, and I see Deborah nodding her head, so I've got these things right. And this is a, a dollar for every covered life, 
uh, later it increases to $2 for every covered life. And then you've probably read in the newspaper from April, I think it was, of 2010 when Obamacare was passed, there's an additional tax on medical device makers. Now, you don't pay that. None of you pay these taxes on medical device makers, but actually you are paying them because if you're like we are, your premiums escalated very quickly in 2010. I know a number of employers in, in North County uh, came to me and said our costs are increasing 20% in 2010. And there was another double-digit increase in 2011. This is why that happened, because there are taxes on medical device makers, 2.3%. Uh, uh, there's a tax on pharmaceutical manufacturers, uh, which rises to $4.2 billion nationwide by 2018, $3 billion in 2014. There's taxes on health insurance providers. As their costs go up, they raise their prices, and our costs go up as well. Uh, and then uh, in 2014, states are required to establish the transitional nonprofit reinsurance entities. That's, or, that's not the exchanges. That's a reinsurance uh, backup plan, if you will, for the exchanges. And that all costs money, just a mere uh, $12 billion and then... Uh, lowering to eight billion and then five billion, but you start, you know, a billion here, a billion there. Eventually, you got a lot of money. So this is what it does to Tri City Medical Center. Uh, we've been controlling our costs very well. I said 14 million. Uh, this shows 15 million in 2012, the year we're in now, rising to 16 million in 2013, and that's mostly that tax I was talking about, that one dollar rising to two dollars. And then the health, health exchanges kick in, and we start having to insure people, and you can see what happens. By 2018, our costs uh, are up, not quite doubled, but they're up substantially. And this is an employer uh, who provides an excellent health insurance plan for their employees, full coverage for all of our employees for self only. And this is what Obamacare does to us. Based on our best projection, this has been vetted through two different insurance companies, and they have said, absolutely, that's where you're going to be. Now, we'll be struggling to keep these costs down, but uh, this is going to hurt. So now there's a series of slides here that I uh, will attribute to a law firm called Manat Phelps. I'm going to let you see these uh, for yourselves. Uh, but they have a very good summary of how the whole exchange process is going to uh, roll up, and you should go on our website and see it. Uh, they actually did this in a, uh, a conference call with hospitals across the country, so I'm sure they don't mind if I share it because that was the whole purpose of putting it out in public view. So there's uh, a bunch of slides here that basically uh, show you the cost. Now, this is an interesting thing here. Because this is a law firm, Manette Phelps, who took the law, the 2,400 pages, dissected it, analyzed the Supreme Court case, and then said, here's the cost. Between 2014 and 2019, the United States will pay an additional $930 billion, almost a trillion dollars, in health care costs. Employers will pick up the lion's share of those costs. And then uh, this, this talks about... Uh, uh, California and what's going to happen to California, how many people will be additionally insured. You have 1.6 million uh, on Medi-Cal, another 2.1 million will fall into the exchanges, so 3.7 million additional insured. Again, I'm going to attribute this to uh, the law firm, Manette Phelps. Uh, and then I'm going to let you go through the rest of the slides yourself. Um, essentially what it says is this is not free. It's, there's no free lunch in, in Obamacare. Uh, this is a Supreme Court decision, and you all remember uh, Justice Roberts' famous uh, pronouncement that uh, this, uh, the penalty was not actually a penalty. It's a tax, and, and therefore uh, it's, uh, it's legal. Um, the only section that, he, that the Supreme Court overruled was that states can choose not to expand the Medicaid to cover all state residents uh, under 133 percent of the federal poverty level without risking federal funding for the entire Medicaid program because Justice Roberts concluded uh, that this was uh, not relatively mild encouragement but rather a gun to the head. So uh, I'm going to let you go through the rest of this stuff which is all produced by Manhattan is good information uh, but what it basically tells you is that uh, this is going to be 
uh, fairly expensive. So I'm going to flip through these. Uh, and so the bottom line is you need to know your own company. You need to know what your plan is. You need to know what you're going to have to pay for. Uh, you need to read the regulations because we are, Tri-City has become and has been approved to be one of the 106 accountable care organizations in the country. Out of over 5,000 hospitals, we've created an ACO, which I'm very excited about. It's going to allow us uh, a lot of uh, interesting opportunities. But the ACO portion of the statute was 20 pages, and the regulations implementing ACOs was 500 pages. So you can take the more than 2,000 pages of Obamacare and extrapolate from that the regulations that we're going to see that haven't even been written yet uh, and imagine what regulation we're facing in the future. So be proactive regarding wellness. Deborah mentioned that. That's a key uh, requirement of the, of the statute. Analyze your own plan and stay on top of the requirements. And uh, here's a bibliography in case you have nothing to do at night and uh, are interested in reading. Thank you. My name is Irma Cota. I'm the CEO of North County Health Services, which is a uh, community health center. So um, what I thought I'd do is first educate you a little bit about what a community health center is, um, how the community health centers operate. So. Uh, the community health center movement started in the late uh, 60s, and it started at the same time that the war on poverty started. Okay, And then a couple of years later, we uh, saw Medicare come around and the Medicaid program come around. So, um, as you can imagine, if you were at that time, if this was happening, and this discussion right now was happening in the late 60s, we would also be very concerned about the, this Medicare program people are talking about and this Medicaid program people are talking about. Okay? So why were community health centers um, established and why did Congress uh, made a move to begin to fund community health centers is because they found that while um, a lot of poor individuals were having access to a Medicaid program and a Medicare program, um, they were finding that there were not enough providers accepting those two plans. And so um, the, we had a lot of people that we call them underinsured as well as, as the uninsured, and so they established a the community health center movement. Um, to, today, uh, 45 years later, um, there's 1,800 a, a uh, health centers throughout the country serving almost 20 million people in North County Health Services is one of those 1,800. Um, and the impetus um, about this program um, is really the those that have government insurance, but, but also the working poor who do not have health insurance. And the majority of the people in the health center are really under the 200% of poverty. So in today's dollars for a family of four, that's about $24,000. Whether it's in California, whether you live in Texas, whether you live in Mississippi, the poverty level in terms of income is, is the same. So obviously the dollars go a little further if you live in, in, an, in another state. Um, the other part of um, the, um, the community health center movement is that um, it, um, it is based on a, a board of directors, and the board of directors, in terms of the governance, the majority of the, are the consumers, so it's, they're called the consumer board, so that consumers can participate in, in the policy and in program developments of a community clinic. So it's a consumer board. Um, and the, the qualifications for a health center uh, is that you have to provide a regular reports to the federal government. It, it's under the, the health administration and under the Bureau of Pri uh, Primary Care. Um, within um, the uh, reports that we have to submit, we have to also meet certain uh, quality metrics. We have to be licensed by the state. Um, here it's licensed by the state of California. You have to be open to inspections. Uh, private doctors, medical groups, they don't have to be subject to that type of licensing and, and inspection. Um, in terms of the community clinic movement under the Federal Office of Management and, and Budget, we're considered one of the top 10 um, programs that the government uh, runs or helps operate, and uh, we are part of that safety net system that the, that the nation has for the, for the poor and underinsured. 
So in terms of um, North County Health Services, uh, we are one of those nonprofit organizations. Um, we have been around for over 40 years. We were initially established by uh, UCSD. Uh, UCSD uh, Community Health uh, helps support North County Health Services, uh, San Ysidro Health Center, and family, family health centers in, uh, in San Diego. We were the originally federally funded health centers in San Diego. There's now uh, 15 other federally funded health centers. Um, for us, uh, we service 60,000 people in North County, so we're a regional provider. We, we're in five cities. Um, we credential all of our uh, clinicians. Uh, we're, we're a Jake accredited organization. We hire all the, the clinicians in our service, and uh, together with the clinicians and the support staff, we employ 560 uh, employees. So we're one of the large employers in the, in the area. Um, as part of being a large employer and as part of a community health center movement, uh, we were intended to be part of the economic engine in, in a neighborhood or in the, in the community. And the intention of that economic engine, aside from providing comprehensive care, was to also uh, provide employment in those communities uh, from people who live in, in those communities. Um, so we, um, our clini clinicians maintain privileges at at three different uh, hospitals in, in the region. So we're a regional provider. Um, we have uh, experience in, in the medical market um, in, in the managed care market. So um, from, um, if you look at from the private perspective, we're, we are a medical group. Uh, like a gray bill, like a, a, a Sharpery Steely, uh, or Scripps a Medical Group. Uh, some people know it as, as independent private practices or IPAs. So basically, all of the clinicians are employed. We we have um, uh, common protocols, uh, common uh, directives, um, and so we have a, a common system. So the only difference between uh, North County Health Services is that it's a nonprofit and has a, govern, a governing board uh, compared to the the private sector. Um, of the, within the Medi-Cal population, we have a, a large managed care contract with the three um, major Medi-Cal providers, which is Molina Community Health Group and, and Care First. And then we also have experience in full professional risk. Uh, so we have 12,000 patients that we help manage their care with us throughout the continuum of care. Uh, they receive primary care with us. We uh, work with specialists in the communities whom we, we pay out of the monies that we get from uh, contracts. And then we also then follow uh, our patients uh, throughout the, the has hospital experience and help coordinate uh, with, for, with hospital experience as well as with specialists uh, delivering that care. Um, for us, within the um, adult population, and, and one of the reasons why we're so tied in with what's going to be happening with health care reform is because 75% um, of our, our patients are the young adults, and I call it 21 to 45 are young adults, now that I just turned 59 uh, this week. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, the young. Um, so uh, our concern about um, these clients is that they're uninsured. And so um, for, there is a potential for that uninsured then to, to benefit from what's going to happen in health care reform. Um, we have uh, taken advantage of some of the federal funds and also the, the meaningful use dollars that the government has put out to, to buy uh, electronic health records. So our patients uh, throughout the, the system of care that we have the 10 sites are now uh, connected through one common electronic health records. Um, we provide, a, as part of the mandate of a community clinic, we do provide comprehensive health services. And when we say comprehensive, it's not just medical, dental, social services, but we provide the, the health education, the coordination of care, the, the referral, we provide some transportation, we provide um, uh, linguistic assistance uh, to, uh, to our patients as well. And we have a very long history of, of providing and tracking HEDAS information, which is uh, you know quality metrics that all health insurance are required uh, to, to, to cover. Um, our budget is a $45 million operational budget, um, annual budget. 
Um, 60 percent of our dollars come from Medi-Cal. Um, 11 percent of the dollars come from self-pay patients, but they represent, you know, 30 percent of the visits. That's about 93,000 visits a year that is paid by um, so the self-pay uninsured. 10 percent comes from the federal uh, government. The, the, those dollars are, is what allows us to provide a sliding scale, 50 percent for dental care, and then 75 percent discount or 50 percent discount on the, on the clinical side. Um, 6 percent is healthy families, which is a misnomer, is really children under 19. Uh, and then 7 percent comes from the, the number of grants that allows us to do what we do for for their patients, such as the WIC nutrition program, the HIV program, you know, family planning, and also health care for the homeless. So, what about um, health care reform? Health care reform, uh, the accountable care uh, services that we, we've been discussing. Um, the uh, the, the really the, at the core of reform, and you've seen the data, it's really about cost containment. Uh, it's really about improving the quality of care, and it's also about engagement, patient engagement. Um, the, I think that the public in general has felt disenfranchised from their own care um, because they, they don't always understand what's going on. They don't always understand the, the, the lingo that, that the doctors are talking about or their specialists. So at, at the core, of again, of, of accountable care is that patient engagement. Um, so for us, um, we really look at an opportunity that we can really have an impactful role in healthcare reform uh, because we can build on what we already have that we've been providing over the years and we can build on the experience of taking care of the uninsured. Um, and so these are the majority of the people that are uninsured in our system are really the working poor that works for uh, either the, the restaurant industry, the hotel industry, that work with um, you know car industry, the, your mechanics, uh, your gardeners. So we're really talking about the, the, the working poor. And in reality, most of those working poor are really not going to qualify for the Medicaid but because when you really look at the income for the qualification of the Medicaid of 133%, um, you know, for a family of four at 133%, you're really looking at about $15,000 a year. So it's really not a lot of money. So most of the working poor, they're, they're, they're working poor couples. So they tend to be closer to that 200% of poverty. So they're the ones who are going to fall into this exchange that, that we've been talking about. So we really see an opportunity for us, again, to be impactful um, in, with, this, with this patient. So in order for us to, to really um, be as in, impactful, we're in the process of what we call trans transforming our own system. And while we've had a comprehensive system, we realize that we still need to do a lot more to meet the, really the mandates of, of, of the triple aim. And so you, you've been hearing about uh, what the medical home is, and um, you've been hearing about, and maybe we haven't mentioned enough today, but one of the uh, requirements uh, is it's really to, for providers to be accredited under the, um, the National Committee of, of, of Quality Care. And so we, our, our aim is to, to, to receive this accreditation of patient center home. And really at the heart of, of um, the patient center home is um, the the impanelment up on the left hand corner. Um, impanelment uh, means that um, that our patients will be assigned a physician. And for our patients, they really, whoever they see, they love, they care. I mean, so whether we tell them it's Dr. You know, Kevin Ellis or Dr. Ken Morris, um, they've been coming to us for, for quite a while and the clinicians have been with us for many, many years that uh, it's going to be actually be difficult for us to say, you, you know, you, you can only say uh, this doctor and that doctor because at, le and it, at least the, the, there's a requirement that you offer them uh, to be in a panel of one physician. But the, the next to impanelment is really team-based uh, care. And in team-based care, um, it's, so it's not just impanelment, but the patient will have access to uh, maybe a nurse practitioner that's working with that doctor. They'll have access to a health educator, uh, to a nurse. They'll have access to even to someone to, to do you know home visits if that's what the client requires. So when they, they call in and they want to speak to the doctor and the doctor's not available, the individuals that have been assigned to that patient, that team, uh, will know that case very well and will be able to, to help that client and maybe even uh, avoid an office visit. 
So in terms of saving, yes, there's going to be a lot of other costs, but there's also going to be opportunities by restructuring how you do and repositioning your assets, your, your, your most uh, valuable asset, which is your personnel, repositioning them in such a way that you can be more efficient and impactful in the kind of care that you provide. Another requirement is open access, and um, we're very excited about open access because we're already making uh, headways in that, and that is to um, be able to give people a, a same-day appointment. And um, the, the culture of people um, who um, are um, the uninsured oftentimes is to just walk in. Oh, I have, I've, my boss says I, I don't have to work eight hours today, I've been meaning to go to the doctor, I'm going to go to the doctor. Or uh, I'm off a little earlier, my child's been running into cold, I'm going to go to the, to the doctor. So we have been uh, running some experiments in our clinics to educate our patients to call us when they're going to come in and educate them to call us when they're not going to come in. And it's been amazing how um, welcoming people have been in terms of us engaging them to help us uh, be able to be more accessible to them. So open access is, again, transforming our system, and we're very happy to do it, and we're, we're seeing the patient satisfaction go up, which is another aspect about um, a patient-centered home. Um, the, the whole patient engagement uh, is, is real, a really big requirement, and uh, you're supposed to provide evidence, not just in the impenalment and team care open access. Um, you're supposed to provide evidence, and we are beginning to track, you know, this this metrics in order uh, to create a patient center home. Um, our patient satisfaction um, is starting to go up. It was always, I think, very decent, but it's, it's going up. And within the patient satisfaction and patient engagement, we've created a number of focus groups and uh, from our, our patients. Our patients are, are giving us feedback, and we're meeting with them as often as we can uh, to even in test some uh, materials that we want to provide or, or test um, some educational uh, format that, that we want to introduce. Um, and then there's a meaningful use, the MU and the HEDIS. Um, this has to do with uh, quality metrics. And they're not just your traditional quality metrics in terms of outcomes uh, for controlling uh, uh, the sugar levels of a diabetic or, or controlling the blood pressure or providing the kinds of preventive screening, some of the, which uh, Larry was talking about. Um, it's really talking about measuring metrics and really showing true outcomes that is part of Meaningful Use that we're also very excited. And uh, the other thing about Meaningful Use uh, that we're implementing is that every patient now is getting the, basically the discharge summary. So before we didn't do that, it's now part of the transformation and part of having electronic records. So at the end of the day, when the, the end of the visit, um, the patient knows uh, what the diagnosis was, what the medications is, how they're supposed to take the medication, when they need to come back, and, and what, uh, um, what are the behavioral changes that they need to do. Because part of the patient engagement, and if we're going to have any really true improvements in quality of care, we need the patient to be part of that for formula. And so they need to think seriously about what they need to do in their own uh, care in order to improve the, the outcomes and improve the metrics. So they have some responsibilities. So for us, in terms of health care reform, there's opportunities and there's threats. For us, clearly, um, and for any other doctor in the community who's seeing the uninsured, there is an opportunity that um, their cost of, of, of providing care and an opportunity for um, no longer having uh, you know, large uh, uh, write-ups because people can't afford the care, there's an opportunity that you can recover. Um, uh, some of those expenditures because people will have uh, insurance and it will be easier for us to connect the patient to a specialist. Right now, um, Larry mentioned that there's two months to get a cardiologist. That's if you have insurance. If you don't have insurance, I have to refer a patient to um, a UCSD who, who happens to be seeing the uninsured. That could be nine months. If you need to see a neurologist, that could be nine months. So the opportunity is not just immediately for us that these patients will have insurance. It's really that our providers will be able to do what they can do in terms of coordinating the care with a specialist and in, 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 in getting involved with the patient because the system will, will put people with, that are insurance a little quicker on that queue. 
the, the threat for us then is the potential loss. Uh, we, we could lose uh, patients to the, to the private sector. Um, so the question will be, will the private sector see more Medi-Cal patients than they currently see now? And will the private sector uh, take on the low-cost health insurances that the health um, insurance exchange will be offering? So for us, that's the question. So we'll say, well, let's see. What can we do? What, what do I do in order to um, prevent the flow of patients out of our system? Well, we can build on the fact that our patient satisfaction is at 90% plus. We can build on the, on the high patient retention. We, we uh, retain 94% of our patients year over year. We can build on our physician retention. We're also, we've been running physician retention for almost at 95%. We have doctors with us that, that started as rookies right out of UCSD residency and have stayed with us for 20 plus years. Um, we can also build on what we already do for our patients in terms of patient education and patient engagement. In terms of responding to the threats, uh, we're really working on that. We've, we've joined um, uh, an, an IP, we've joined actually two IPAs um, so that we can have access to the commercial market and people in the commercial market can choose us. And as those IPAs later on enter into uh, low cost health insurances with the health plans, um, then we will be part of that network of care that people can be referred to us. Um, we're also um, identi trying to identify other partners in the, in the community. We, we have joined um, the, the Tri-City Hospitals um, Accountable Care Organization uh, for the uh, for the um, senior population. So we are we are currently looking to see how else can we part of that larger fiber of the, of the of the private and larger medical system in the area. Um, and then, uh, what, so our value, what, what kind of value do we bring to, to the partners that we will be doing business with? Um, the fact that we have a good delivery system um, that's uh, across, across the re region, we have a good track record of, of, of quality providers, We've been, have, ha we have a systems of evidence-based uh, best practices and, and quality metrics, we have the electronic health system, we have e-prescribing, we uh, have contracts now with, with Walmart, um, with uh, Walgreens, and we're, we're trying to do a contract with CVS so that we can also um, coordinate the, the prescription and, and, and medication delivery to our clients. Uh, we have extended hours, and we, we expect to extend more hours. And if we can increase the geographic presence of opening other health centers, we will do that. Um, we're also modernizing our buildings so that, you know, people won't come into a clinic and say, oh, my God, am I in the Greyhound bus or where am I? You know, so that they can actually come in and say, oh, my God, this is nice, you know, and usually that's been the reaction we've been getting some of the people coming into our centers. So we're definitely preparing. Uh, we want a partner. Um, and then, of course, the desired partners that we want is, is people that share the same values that we do. When I say values is that, I mean, I, I got into this business in public health because that's, that's my personal mission, and I won't bore you with my personal story, but that's my mission. And that's why a lot of our clinicians and people that work with us, um, this is their mission, that they feel that just because, you know, someone is poor, you can't get a Nordstrom service. We believe otherwise. We believe that because people are poor and they have either medical card or a discounted card, we're still going to give them the same kind of service. And so we want to partner with people and other clinicians and, and medical groups that, that, that have the same values that we do. Um, we uh, also want a relationship with partners that can bring us also, again, the businesses and, and, and have strong relationships with health plans so that we can have better rates than, than I can negotiate on my own. So we can do that in, in a larger system. And um, so we want to increase that. We want them to give us a greater capacity for more patients. Uh, we want a stronger specialty pool because right now that's one of our, our weakness. Um, and then we want a partner that can engage us in decision making and also that are transparent with us and, and transparent with the, with, uh, the data. And um, so the, um, you know, to, sort of to end, um, um, I'm one of those people that my glass is helpful. So um, I want to stay open 
to the changes that are happening in our in our system because you know in, in I, I feel that uh, in, in everything right now we probably are looking at this and it's very fearful in terms of how it's going to affect me personally or how it's going to affect my business but if we pull back and say well is this the right thing for the nation to do um, and I also like to think about the the economic impact that that it's going to have back in the communities uh, for us um, the the um, economic index for a community center is like a, a factor of two. So for our 45 million, it means that we have an economic index of 90 million. For, for Tri-City, you know, how many millions are you? Uh, 400 million. A hospital uh, economic factor is a factor of three. So uh, if the hospital, because of this newly insured, increases the bottom line by another 10 million uh, or 20 million, really the economic factor of those extra 20 million is 6 million in the, in, in the community. So I like to stay open with that. So I will join in the panel and be open for your questions. Thank you. What questions do you have? Uh, if you have a general one and you don't know who you want to direct it to or to answer, that's fine. But if you want to direct a specific question to one of the panelists, please do so. No, I would probably uh, pitch that to Alan. I'm certainly not as familiar with uh, the Massachusetts experiment as he is. Uh, but I, w I would suspect that we would find uh, that the scenario that I went over would be uh, would be a very similar uh, outcome. I, I, I would agree with that based on the graphs I showed earlier. One of the impacts that was quite clear when the reform was passed in 2006 was immediately the Massachusetts health care costs took off, which is what motivated the new bill. So I think it would be a similar experience. In my view, it's not going to change it right away. Um, Right, I think the first, and, and I'll tell you why I think that. There are, this is an incredibly complex bill. As a matter of fact, um, when, um, when Larry was talking about the 2,400 pages, there's a little club that um, I'm a member of, and uh, the winner who wins on a particular day is to come up with a new provision nobody knew about. <laughs> anyway. Um, we're talking about putting 32 million, providing 32 million people with insurance who don't have it now. And the, the very big influence of insurance is to increase the cost because it reduces the cost to you in a number of ways. First of all, um, your premiums are subsidized. Um, there's something called the tax deductibility of, of uh, health insurance. When Larry covers me, if I'm an employee of Tri-Cities, I don't pay taxes on the value of the benefit he's given me, number one. Number two, if Rob, if I, if Rob is my um, family physician, as I was mentioning before, if his bill is really $100 that the insurer is going to pay, but I only pay 20 I have the incentive to use more. This is no different than saying if you are a lover of avocados and you can get three for a dollar today and four for a dollar tomorrow, are you about to... If there are 25 cents versus 33 cents, aren't you going to buy more avocados if they're 25? So we know that health insurance itself is cost enhancing. I'm not saying that's bad because there are many benefits of it. But when 32 million more people go on, costs are going to be higher. The experience in Medicare has been I, I tend to say this is a work in progress because I remember when Medicare, when Medicare was passed and we're still trying to fix it. So I think our costs are going to go up, but there are all these other things, all the reimbursement changes, the ACOs that Tri-City is going to become. Once it, 
that's perfected, I actually think we'll all be better off. Costs will not be rising as quickly as they are, and I actually think we're going to get better, better care. And when I heard that Irma's group was part of your ACO, that is a wonderful thing because it's not all been coordinated before. So um, I hope that answered your question. In, in order to make Obamacare work for us, yes. what will we need to change? Right. Everything. Uh, and, there, and I agree with Deborah. There are some real positives here. My question isn't, is Obamacare positive from a clinical standpoint, quality standpoint? It's whether we can afford it. It's just a simple uh, mathematic uh, equation. Can we afford it? So what's positive about it? Um, there, every hospital in the country is <laughs> scrambling now to improve the quality of care. Why are they doing that? Because they're being economically in, uh, forced to do it. For instance, starting next year, we're not going to get paid for a readmission after heart attack. We're not going to get paid for a readmission after a congestive heart failure. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you, except when you look at the national statistics, 22% of heart attack patients are readmitted to the hospital nationwide within the first 30 days. So if you don't get paid for 22% of your work, you're out of business. So hospitals are scrambling to figure out how to reduce that number. Our number at Tri-City now for the last six months for that same metric is 8%. And we were just identified as fifth best in the country in lowest readmission rates uh, within 30 days for heart attack, and our rate was 15% because they aggregate the last three years. So we're scrambling and very successfully uh, finding ways to reduce readmission rates. That improves the quality. Uh, the things that we're doing primarily are following the patients. We're having follow-up visits immediately after you leave. <laughs> we're staying with the patient. Did you take your medications? Did you see your doctor? We're forcing that behavioral change uh, on our patients. That's all good. And I think that that trend you'll see accelerated and continue goes to Deborah's point of improved quality of care. That all is getting better. The question is, can we afford that in the United States today? Can we pay a trillion dollars over the next four years to see this happen? The best resources, you know, there's only two ACOs in this entire county. Uh, SHARP uh, was, a, was approved for the um, what they call the Pioneer ACO, which is a larger format. You had to have at least 15,000 Medicare lives to qualify for that. Uh, we have about 8,000 Medicare lives, and we were qualified for what's called the Shared Savings Program. Uh, it's a combination uh, between, um, between our doctors. Uh, we actually have uh, more than 60 now primary care physicians in the group. I think that's even before Irma's group was added. Uh, and we're we're gathered, we have all of our specialists, all of our what we call house-based uh, docs uh, involved in our ACO. Uh, to get the information on that, you know, it's developing. Uh, and I would say, uh, maybe, maybe selfishly, look at our website because we're going to be publishing our results and information regarding uh, our ACO. And there aren't very many of them. As I said, there's only 106 in the country. And many of them are not really hospital-based. They're based out of uh, medical groups and, uh, and clinics uh, more than they are hospitals. Very few hospitals were willing to take uh, the risk of becoming an ACO. And also the ACOs right now is just for, for the Medicare population, the, the regulations for accountable care organizations for the non-Medicare have not been created. A lot of that is unknown. I mean, that, that line is scary to me, which is why I wanted to show it, because a $10 million increase in health care costs uh, in, over a five-year period is astronomical. It's something we've never seen. I think it's correct. Uh, we're profitable now. Uh, we will get, as I, as I indicated, we will get paid uh, for a significant amount of work uh, that we don't get paid for now. Uh, when Obamacare is fully implemented in 2014. Uh, so that will offset a lot of those uh, costs, uh, the, the costs of taxes. But other employers don't have that advantage. So uh, I said in my uh, presentation that I think hospitals will come out the best uh, in Obamacare because of that cost shifting. Um, there's, a, there's a law that was passed 40 years ago, I think, uh, the EMTALA law, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act that requires any emergency room in the United States to accept uh, any patient that presents uh, and, and treat them to the point of what's called stabilization without 
reference to whether they can pay for that care or not. doesn't mean you follow them for the rest of their life. You just have to get them uh, stabilized, uh, and then you're allowed to discharge them. We don't discharge them. We usually take care of them to the point where they're safe, not just stabilized in, in our system. Uh, so I think the, the offset uh, will work to the hospital's advantage, and I'm expecting to see a slight positive for the hospital. I, my, my biggest concern isn't us as an employer. It's all the other employers that don't have that offsetting revenue uh, to compensate for the costs that they're going to see. So I think we'll be fine uh, and, and be able to grow our business. There, we certainly have data in terms of what we provide as uh, charity care and what we call bad debt, and those are the two categories that uh, uh, people who can't pay fall into. They either There's a, a legal qualification for what constitutes charity care, and the combination of those for a hospital our size uh, is in the range of $30 million a year. Gross charges would be $100 million a year. Uh, just to um, simplify that, uh, we generate about $1.2 billion in charges. As I think you know, uh, when you get your hospital bill or your medical bill, uh, it does not reflect what you actually pay. There's, uh, there are what are called contractual allowances that are put on top of what you've actually <laughs> contractually agreed to accept as appropriate payment. But a rough order of magnitude, it's between uh, 5 and 10 percent of our total costs uh, come through the emergency room in the form of either charity care or uh, bad debt. But we don't stratify it according to what is an emergency and what is not an emergency because we treat everyone. Uh, you know, in emergencies, there's a number of different categories of what kind of an emergency it is, uh, but we don't actually break it down the way you're asking. But it's, uh, uh, I'll say, approximately 10 percent of our costs. Well, um, historically, hospitals have been about 50 cents on the dollar, doctors about 30 to 35, drugs about 10, and then there's everything else. Um, that hasn't changed fundamentally, has it? No. Um, so. In the last 40, 50 years. Uh, I think another answer to your question might be who's, who has been the profiteer in the healthcare system. That's kind of the question that I heard, you know. And uh, and uh, speaking for hospitals, I'll say that most hospitals have trouble making a profit. There are exceptions. Uh, I came uh, to this county from Orange County, uh, and I still know the hospitals there uh, better than I do here in terms of their profitability. And I can tell you there are four or five hospitals in Orange County that are wildly profitable mm -hmm. uh, beyond almost anyone's imagination than everybody else who's just struggling, and those are the hospitals that I ran. Uh, Tri-City is now doing well, but we wouldn't compare with the profitability being generated by uh, Hogue, yeah, mm -hmm. Hogue uh, even UCI, mm -hmm. uh, UCSD, uh, and not to bash them, it's just that they have a different reimbursement mechanism, and, and they are... No matter what anybody tells you, the UC system is a very profitable medical center. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. They have an academic mission. They they do uh, they do teaching. They they uh, they breed our doctors of the future. You know, so there's a, and there's a value to that. But they're paid very handsomely for that. Uh, so, uh, but but uh, to answer your question, I wouldn't say that the hospitals have profiteered, although with some exceptions. Uh, but I think the insurance companies have done amazingly well. All you got to do is, uh, uh, if you're so inclined, just to go read the, the 10Ks uh, for the major insurance companies, uh, I think all of which are public companies, certainly most of which are public are. companies. Most of them. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can, you can see the profits that they generate and the salaries. People complain about my salary. Go look at their salaries, mm -hmm. you know. Um, <laughs> let's, let's have a North County Times report on I that. I would add, <laughs> when it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than this, but if you remember, I tried to explain what, a lo what the medical loss ratio was, mm -hmm. okay? Um, the, ru the rule of thumb is the higher is the lo the highers or the lowers the loss ratio. In other words, the more of your premium that's paid out to reimburse burse you, the lesser is the profit. So, the eighty percent, um, the eighty percent medical loss ratio is supposed to sort of protect against that, except that a lot of the the what are regarded as the best known plans, and many but not all are nonprofit, 
run close to 90. That means they're keeping 10%, and that's supposed to cover administrative cost, and the profit would come out of there. So um, look for those numbers, which will be published under the new law, and uh, you're going to get slapped if you're less than 80, and there are a lot of um, health insurers who are scrambling to get up to 80. Um, you might have noticed that Anthem was one of those that it's been all over the news here. Um, and I'm not picking on them. It's just they've had to give money back in order to make it. So. Okay, a little, a little bit on that because uh, with Deborah's point on the medical loss ratios, you've all, all of you who are insured either have gotten some notice from your insurer about how much they're going to pay you. Mm -hmm. Well, I belong, because I'm a retired federal employee, I belong to what's called the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. That insures millions of uh, existing and former federal employees. And uh, we got a notice recently in our mailbox saying that the medical loss ratio rebate, I don't know exactly mm -hmm. what they called it, but whatever that name is, uh, was so small it would literally generate a check for only pennies so they were going to hold it uh, in abeyance and just suck it up in future premiums. So I'm not sure that that, that whole piece of the legislation is, uh, uh, is going to be such a, such a powerful piece because that's millions of Americans and we're getting nothing from that. I, okay. I well, just want to make a come. Someone else said something about how will the system look like in, in 2016. And um, in San Diego, we're in a unique position because in, in San Diego, there's already been a lot of consolidation in the healthcare industry. It's called the, the, the integrated delivery systems, the SHARPs, the, the Scripps, the UCSD, and all the affiliated physicians. And then when you look at California, it's also pretty well consolidated. There's still a lot more consolidation needs to happen. Unlike, uh, as Dr. Sugarman, and talked about Massachusetts, it, and especially in Boston. The consolidation started occurring in Boston probably about eight years ago, and it's, it's finally getting to a fever pitch. But I think that uh, since the aim of, of health care reform is, again, a, a cost uh, reduction, the way that it's going to happen is when, as more groups um, either align or merge or con uh, consolidate, um, they will be able to manage the care better because they'll be able to share the data. And when we're looking at where the dollars being spent, a lot of the dollars being spent um, is really misspent dollars because of the of the poor coordination in in, in, in many cases. So, so those when when you see more of that consolidation, um, you will also see more of the information sharing and and and, and being able to manage care better. We get two things are going on. Uh, the primary one is that we get a lot of unneeded care because the incentive is to deliver it, deliver it, deliver it. Um, other, the other, other stories that are sort of a corollary to that, there's some very well-known studies that took place that were done by the uh, faculty who were jointly appointed at UCLA and the RAND Corporation which basically show that we don't get, there's a, um, Larry mentioned the idea of healthcare variability. Um, that we don't get the right care at the right time. And you can live in one place and get it 30% of the time and another place 70 or 80% of the time, but nobody gets it 100% of the time. So there's a lot of belief that a lot of waste occurs because of fee-for-service insurance. I mean, that's what you hear. Okay, that's I what have, the arguments I, are. I, I, anyway. I need to add to that. I don't disagree with anything that Deborah said, but two words I would add to that, tort reform. Uh, the doctors are scared to death not to give you 20 different tests because if, you, if the 20th test that they were going to give you and decided not to was the one that really would have uh, nailed down the diagnosis you're, and you sue them for that. Only in California and a few other states is there any significant tort reform. And even in California, 
there are exceptions to that. I won't go into the details. But in many states, there's no tort reform whatsoever. And the doctors are scared to death, so they overpractice. Uh, we overdiagnose, we overtreat. Uh, so it is so. It is the same point that Deborah's raising, just from a different vantage point. Well, I guess from my perspective, and I'll let Larry chime in as CEO of a hospital. Massachusetts is taking the view that fee for service is one of the issues. The second one would be coordination of care right. for a patient, and, and that's why they're putting so much emphasis on some of the data and technology issues. And the third one is just pricing. A lot, when I use that example of a CT scan, when you have two of the major providers or three of the major providers in Boston with wildly different pricing for the same service, they're not, Massachusetts isn't going to dictate the pricing. They just want to make that information available and transparent to the public. So I think it's an array of issues. I would say. And fee for service is definitely one of the big ones. I, you know, if I put on my health economist hat and I'm one of those card carriers, I would say fee for service is, I would say, the first culprit. But if I put on my patient hat and my former um, hospital administrator hat, um, I will tell you what really bothers me. Um, when you go to the doc, this is not to malign doctors, so I'm going to try to say this very, very carefully. Um, there's a lot of very, if, if I have the same problem and I go to three different doctors, I'm going to get three different answers and three different set of tests. Um, there is really very scant information on what really works and whom when. Um, I would feel a lot better if the evidence base of what to do when was really there. There's something uh, in the ACA that calls for money for something called comparative effectiveness studies. And what that really is is if there's something wrong with you and there are two or three ways to treat it, what's going to be the most effective way, most cost effective way most of the time? Um, I really think we need that. There's not one single thing. I don't think that um, we'd want to get rid of fee for service without having more information about what, when we go to an ACO, what really works, whose responsibility, who should deliver it. So I think that things are really going to get better because the pressure is on. Um, but I. I'm not the one who thinks that that's the answer because I think that's only one slice of the pie. And if I can interject quickly, before joining my current company, I was CFO of a group of 450 emergency room physicians. They were very sophisticated in terms of technology. We had 12 million patient records in our database that we'd seen over the years. And a group of the physicians, all physicians, and they let the bean counter in just to observe, they tried to do what Deborah was talking about and saying, well, we know we see these kinds of patients for heart attack, uh, aortic dissection, whatever. We should be able to routinize our care treatment patterns because we have it all electronically, get the highest quality pattern of care, and they couldn't come to agreement on it. Had, did you read? Did you read a tool's uh, cheesecake? Anybody read? You mentioned McAllen, Texas. Well, two months ago, or last month, in the New Yorker, Gawande starts writing, "Why isn't healthcare like the Cheesecake Factory?" And he literally went in to what to talk to their quality improvement people about how it is they turn out a good meal for so many things all of the time. So I think, you know, you'd be amused. Oh, I, I, wanted, sure. to answer, I wanted to answer Go that ahead. question, too, because I think, I think this is an important educational piece. Uh, you may not be aware that all hospitals set their own pricing structure, uh, and that's true across the country, so that uh, every CEO gets to sit <laughs> down uh, with what they call a charge master and decide not only what they're going to charge, but where they're going to charge, where, where those charges go. And then there's a thing called contractual allowances, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which is 
uh, the, the deduction uh, from your charge master that the federal government takes and the state takes, and they decide what that is. You negotiate a little bit with the state, you don't negotiate with the feds, they tell you. However, in this, in this uh, milieu, there's not really a free market, uh, and here's why. Uh, because, and, and the proof of this was on the Wall Street Journal front page just last week when the uh, Attorney General in California issued subpoenas to five of the major health care systems in the state of California. Uh, so who were they? Sutter Healthcare, 30-some hospitals, Dignity Health, formerly known as California Healthcare uh, West, about the same size, uh, Scripps Health, and Sharp, two in San Diego. And why did, they, why did she issue those subpoenas? She did it because those systems are so large in their markets that they actually control the market, mm -hmm. and they're viewed as being yep. anti-competitive. Uh, and what that means to uh, someone like Tri-City Medical Center is that it's very difficult for us to compete because they can charge virtually whatever they want and they can actually get it. So if you're an insurance company coming to Scripps and you have to have Scripps in San Diego, you cannot afford not to have them. That's the definition of being anti-competitive. You will sign with with whatever they ask you to do. The same with UCSD and I'm not against UCSD, don't get me wrong, but they're a what we call a quaternary care provider. So there's certain things that you will only find at UCSD and all hospitals refer that work in there. Because they provide that service, if you're an insurance company, you cannot not contract with them. You will contract with them, period, whatever they ask for. So what that means is that they're on a competitive level of their own. Uh, and that skews uh, the reimbursement level. It's the reason, the main reason, why some hospitals are wildly profitable and others struggle just to make ends meet and others fail. Do you uh, want to say well, something, well, Irma? I'll, I'll start there. And, and um, the, um, you're right, the, what you're talking about, there's that, 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 that social side of medicine. The social that, determinants that social of disease. Exactly. Is what social we determinants call it. of disease that um, as a, as a medical society, we haven't grappled well with that. And I think that's part of what um, the accountable care um, is attain, uh, attempting to, to address. And this is why when they talk about the patient center home, not just in the primary care arena, but they're really talking about in coordination with, with the specialist and in coordination with the hospital. Uh, for instance, now um, we chose to do this with the, with the hospital in that the, the um, people that are getting discharged without a, ho without a doctor, they're referred to the clinic, people that are getting discharged from the emergency room and they don't have a medical home, they, they get referred over um, to the clinic for care so they can establish a medical home. But um, if we were to be providing that coordinated care, the, the hospital would be working um, with you, if you were part of this accountable care organization, they would be partnering with the, with the physician to make sure that that patient, if they needed intermediate care, would go to either assisted living or a nursing home, you know, a SNF, or they would coordinate with um, the um, nurses to do home visits and so that they could get the care that they need. And maybe if they're a senior uh, individual, they might coordinate with, um, the, um, the, with the senior center for some social support. So in the, in the new system, you will be working together because you will all be responsible for that patient, not just the physician, but the system. And there will be an incentive. The ACOs, um, when all the bills are paid with all the people that are partnering in patient care, it is believed that there will be savings in the system will then, that will then be shared with, with the providers and, and the, those that are partnering in the care of that patient. And in the end, that, that patient would, would be the better and the, the expectation is that they won't be coming back to the hospital within those 30 days or they won't have a readmission or they'll be able to take care of their diabetic, their diabetes and they'll keep their diabetes under control because you coordinated the care with that nutritionist and you coordinate and make, make sure that they had the proper nutrition. So that's in the perfect world. You know, that is what it is, the, the whole accountable care and the accountable care organizations it's intending to do. No, um, it would be pure conjecture, in my view. It's only meant for the Medicare. I don't think he's come up with a plan. Right, for he everyone. doesn't have. He, his plan is just for Medicare, anyway. But if you were to take the Medicare portions of the ACA versus the Ryan plan, 
There hasn't been anything. I mean, the Ryan, what happened last year was the Ryan, something like the Ryan plan, but not exactly like it. Um, was, in other words, what he, what is on the Republican platform now is similar to, but not identical to what Mr. Ryan himself proposed that cr actually crossed um, party lines last year. Um, and there was, there's now, it wouldn't, it was simply a side by side projection. The uh, CBO and the GAO didn't uh, cost out the comparison that I'm aware of. So it would be pure conjecture. It's a very, very important problem. Um, which I think is is exacerbated in California. It's much worse here. I moved here from the East Coast um, to, about two years ago. It's much worse here. I'll tell you why it's worse here, and that is because the Medi-Cal system, I believe this is correct. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Deborah, but I think it's the lowest paid system of all the states, of all 50 states. It's either the lowest or second to the lowest in terms of the reimbursement. So doctors just don't take it. Doctors are not legally forced to take, to take Medi-Cal, and that will not change under the law. So you add another, what did I say, 3.7 million Californians uh, to the Medi-Cal rolls. Doesn't mean any doctor is going to take them. Uh, of our specialists at Tri-City, many of the specialists do not take Medi-Cal. So I think that's, and I think that's not only going to affect the Medi-Cal patients, people with a Medi-Cal card, I think it's going to affect people with a Blue Cross card also. Well, that was, uh, that was the point I tried to make in my presentation is that uh, personally, I don't think the country can afford this. Does it work? Uh, we'll see. I think we're going to find out whether it works or not. And there's going to be an unlevel playing field because I think hospitals are going to do okay. I think docs are not going to do okay. I think a lot of patients are going to be unhappy. But I think in the aggregate, we have skyrocketing costs. And even Deborah, who uh, I, I would I would say she leans to supporting the legislation more than not, uh, has indicated that there is a cost increase involved in this. And my slides show it's a trillion dollars. That's not an uh, insignificant sum. I Somebody think has that to pay there's that. a lot that's wrong with the legislation. Myself. All right. Um, what you say is true. Most of uh, all the states can bargain. Um, with pharmaceutical companies over the price they have to pay to acquire the drugs. Uh, at the state level, that was prohibited as a way um, of getting large pharma to agree to support the ACA. Okay, so that's where that came from. The only other thing in the legislation that I'm aware of, and again, um, my, my club hasn't come up with what I didn't know about um, pharmaceuticals, but it might be in there. Um, in essence, right now, do you all know what Medicare Part D is? That's the drug benefit, and there's this donut hole in the middle. That's going to go away. But um, there's nothing in the legislation that I'm aware of that is going to fundamentally deal with um, how quickly pharmaceutical costs are rising. That, that's being dealt with right now. You know what the triple tier is. You generally pay less out of pocket for um, a prescription that's filled with a generic drug than with a brand name than with a breakthrough. So. Uh, I don't know that that's going to fundamentally change, but I think that there's going to be a focus on which drug is prescribed in the context of an ACO. I, I think that's right, and uh, I agree with everything Deborah said about pharma. And then I would ask the basic question is, uh, can we afford it? Because uh, the cost of drugs are not going to go down. Somebody's going to fill that donut hole. It's money that fills that donut hole, and that comes from taxes. So there's, uh, there's uh, embedded taxes right. uh, in the legislation that are designed to compensate for that. So it's not a matter, you know, drug costs are not going to go down. And on your issue of uh, the high tech, we generally dis say that over time, the, quote, intensity of a visit has increased. That is, if you look at how you would have 
I have mild, I have mild to moderate asthma. It rarely kicks up on me. But the way it was treated 20 years ago is very different than the way it's treated now. There are more drugs, there are more tests, and I get all of those now. And that's the intensity factor, which is the high-tech factor. Um, if, if you look around uh, at what insurers are doing uh, right now, they've put in, most all of them have put in what's called prior authorization. And this is for when you get an MRI or a CAT scan because that stuff's gone through the roof. It used to be you didn't have to ask permission. You just do it. Now you did. That's because of the intensity factor. It's not only gone through the roof, it's on level. It can cost twice as much at Hospital A than it does at Hospital B. Uh, I do. I think that focus is good. Actually, I think there so maybe Deborah and I are not far apart because I think there are some very good parts of the statute. I like the fact that it covers my son, my 22-year-old son, at home under my plan when he would be off the plan. Otherwise, uh, I like the uh, guaranteed coverage provision. I, I certainly like the wellness provisions, although I think they're uh, infantile in many ways. I mean, they're... Yeah, that's right. example here, the wellness mm -hmm. center. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where yes. you have come. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there aren't enough people that are doing that. And right. I, I just would like to see more motivation for that yeah. in this plan. I don't see that. Well, that's where, where I said the requirement of patient engagement comes in. But if you can prevent one diabetic coma mm -hmm. a year from a, 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 an advanced diabetic who's not going to be in a hospital for two weeks, how much is it for two weeks? At a hospital, um, so if you can, if, if you so if you can prevent um, through education and providing nutrition education and and signing a contract with that patient about you know you've got some responsibility if you can prevent one of those in in multiple you know times it, it, that that's where the savings going to be. Um, there are some health insurance and some employees that are saying to their um, staff who's who's on that road to becoming obese, is already obese or smoking excessively, you will now be able to really say to these individuals, you know, maybe your care will cost more. Your insurance, you maybe it's no longer we're going to provide it free, but you have to maybe pay $50. Now, there's in California, there's laws again, some of that, in terms of how you can approach it, but there's going to eventually become the ways available that uh, across the board you can make some decisions about uh, responsibility of individuals and how much they have you to know, pay. You know, Irma's organization is, is rather unique. I, my ears really perked up when you were describing your health center and in the description um, introducing you, I heard that you also have to do WIC and yes. all these things. Um, before, she was mentioning the social determinants of disease. If you take something like diabetes or eating too much, um, obesity, there are a lot of things out there that have nothing to do that the deliver, that healthcare providers in the delivery system can't fix. Um, if I don't have enough money to buy a fresh apple, and I buy one that's sugary because it's preserved, that's a nutrition problem. If I buy regular spaghetti rather than whole wheat spaghetti, in other words, I haven't bought the whole grain because it's twice as expensive, there are all kinds of problems out there. And we haven't talked about how to put right. everything together yet either. Yeah. 5% of, in Medicare, 5% of the people, okay, 5% of the people use about 80% of the care because of what goes on in the last year of life. Yes, well, of course, we haven't talked about the death panels yet. Uh, <laughs> death <laughs> panels. <laughs> oh, Larry. Now you really woke everyone up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so maybe we need to have that discussion. That's another, another I, I just, session. I, 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 not really in response to that question, but there's a comment that's rolling around in my mind because Deborah mentioned uh, socialized medicine, and this is not socialized medicine. And I have to echo that because I can tell you socialized medicine, I know people uh, in foreign countries, uh, Canada, England, elsewhere, uh, who are in socialized medicine 
uh, systems, and uh, they not only don't get good care, health care is actually rationed, rationed to the extent that they leave their own country to come to this country to get care. So the question I would throw back to the audience is, did we have it so bad that we needed to make a change? Certainly our costs are skyrocketing. I think a lot of that, frankly, could have been dealt with tort reform and other issues rather than uh, changing the entire system because we've, we've thrown the baby out, and I don't know if the bathwater is going with it. Uh, <laughs> but, but it might be. Yeah. But the, the question, uh, um, you know, I, I, I have a, a cousin who's in a nursing home, and I go visit, and I, on occasion I view into the rooms. And um, I, I see people that probably if you give them a choice, they would want to be at home and, and not uh, there for months. And um, we, we have the ability to keep people comfortable at home uh, with palliative care. Uh, of course, it's better if they have a loved one at home or they have nursing uh, attendants coming into their homes. But um, I think that we definitely can do better to help people in, in, um, in those end stages that they can be home and be comfortable. And, um, and, and people should be given those choices. And it would reduce, and, and it's not more so on, on the reduction of cost, but it's more about how to I've give, how to treat people in a respectful manner and in the way they want to be treated. Please give our panelists a rousing round of applause. Thank you so much.